Welcome to Four Kids Flashback. Hello, I am Tara Sands, joined by my co host, Steve Yurko. And you're listening to Four Kids Flashback. Hey. That's true. We do something different every uh, time. <laughs> I know. I pointed. I pointed to him on the Zoom. Like now, he had to say four kids flashback. Um, the only podcast about four kids media, entertainment. Four kids entertainment. Yeah, it had a couple different names. Um, All over. I am excited for our guest today, but I feel like it, this could be a seven-hour interview if I really asked everything I wanted to ask. Probably, I would definitely say this is. I, I would say in terms of uh, you know voice actors, I guess, you know, directors as well, this is probably yeah. one of the first names someone might think of. Uh, they're, uh, they're, I would say, from the very beginning. I don't know. I know yeah. like, we're talking Pokemon yeah. days and maybe even prior to that. but And we're talking about Eric Stewart, in case you're wondering. Um, I've done so, so many uh, convention panels with Eric that I have to... That like I know too much, so I'm gonna have to just play dumb, I guess, and mm-hmm. ask the questions that I think you guys want answers to. Um, but yeah, he was there from the beginning um, of Pokemon, at least, and stayed for a very long time. He did work there for longer than a lot of people did. So as a director um, and a voice talent, so he got to see both sides of it, which I think always makes for a more interesting interview. Uh, yeah. Do you have any specific things you want answers to today? Hmm. I'm just curious because, you know, like I know so much about the, uh, you know, the characters he's played, but he's directed in so many of these dubs. And I really want to hear more about those experiences, uh, not just the what was it like voicing this character, which hopefully yeah, comes up favorite? Yeah. But yeah. I he's directed on a, a ton of these shows and uh, remind me to ask about these uncut dubs. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and Eric, because he is just like me, he is five minutes early and has just entered our Zoom room. So uh, we're going to let him in and we'll be right back with Eric Stewart. Today's guest was both a voice director and an actor at Four Kids and worked on pretty much every single friggin' show they made there, which was like about a million. Um, he is the Squirtle to my Bulbasaur, the Seto Kaiba to my Mokuba Kaiba, but he prefers that we refer to him as his chosen name, Dick Dick Van Dick. Welcome to the show, <laughs> Eric Stewart. Oh, thank Dick. you so much. I mean, so Dick, much. Dick, Van Dick, yes. Dick, Dick, yes. And that's D-I-K, D-I-K, for those of you that's... who are following um, on the PG ratings. Um, no, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Should we get right into the ultimate muscle of it all? I mean, that <laughs> we should say that is a character name from Ultimate Muscle, but I mean, what yeah, an and honor I can, to... You know. I can tell you about the name of that, too. Please, please do. All right, here's the quick here's the quick version of why that name was used in Ultimate Muscle, our version of it. So, whenever we would do a new show, we would have to do a trademark search to see if anybody was using a name. And this guy happened to be a gazelle. For those of you not familiar with Ultimate Muscle, it's a crazy wrestling show. Um, and the, the guys wear a lot of different costumes and, and things like that. Um, so, he looked like a gazelle. And Gazelle Man, the gazelle, all of these things we tried were used already. So I'm, of course, looking things up and trying to figure out different types of uh, antelope, you know, things like that. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I come to the to the, the head producer, uh, Norman Grossfeld, and I'm like, OK, I've got a couple of things here. Uh, there's a. You know, you've got Gazelle, you've got Antelope, you've got Buick, but of course that's a car that's going to be confusing. So, but then there's also a Dick Dick. Um, and so I was thinking maybe we could call him Dick Dick Van Dyke. And Norman looked at me and said, Eric, if we're going to call a character on this show Dick Dick, he's going to be called Dick Dick Van Dick. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. Yeah, yeah. That's how that happened? Oh, yeah. <laughs> For those of you not familiar with this show, it's also a show where they would, the original Japanese, would ask the fan base, which was made up of mostly, I would say, 15-year-old boys, what characters they wanted in the show. And so we had a show where one of the villains was, that's right, a naked butt that's for a right. head, yeah, at Mr. Cheeks, 
um, was his name. Um, and then another one was a man inside a toilet. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to ask that demographic, uh, you know, about what's funny, I mean, obviously bathroom humor, obviously bathroom humor is a, is a is number one. Always right? funny. Yes. Yeah. I just can't believe that was allowed and other things were not. Like, I'm still, like, that's been the most interesting part of this is understanding these kid TV rules. Like, the, yes. funk, like the funky cops had guns, but, you know, no one else could. Um, it's because yeah. they were so funky, I guess. Uh, or <laughs> well, all were... the BSMP stuff. I mean, you know, being a director on so many of these shows and having to deal with, you know, what was going to get, you know, through and what was not going to get through. You know, I've I've spoken about the BSMP rules and the different people that were in charge at the different networks um, f- before. You know, I'll do that at, at a convention or two where that people will be like, why did you change? And I'm yeah. like, I'll explain to you why we changed and why, you know, the rules are in place. But right. it's also so arbitrary to who is working at which network. Right. I could show you the same thing that would be offensive to one person at one network and not at the other. Yep. So, um, yeah. Were you the one that always talks about having, like, three options for lines? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we're yes. we're going to start from the beginning at some point, but I, can you tell that? Because I keep thinking about that during our interviews, and I'm like, I can't wait to talk to Eric so he can explain what he did to get around this. Yeah, so, so um, people um, in, in our business, especially uh, behind the scenes, they love, especially the clients, to have a say, right? You want to be able to say that my opinion counts. So um, what we would do, or at least I did a lot with my show, um, where uh, some of the lines were a little, uh, let's say, risque, but never inappropriate, but definitely there for your parents to watch while they had were forced to watch the cartoon. Well, you had James, you, you like. James walked that line. So, you know, yes. Care, yeah, for sure. He did. So what we would do is you'd have like a very funny line that you wanted that might bend the censor a little bit. They might go, that's that's inappropriate. And and you would also then come up with one that was way too far that you knew was never going to fly. And then one that was just not funny. And so what I would always do is is present it in a way where it was like, hey, uh, you know, let's say number one was boring, number two was the one I wanted, and number three was way over the top. I would submit number number three first and say, hey, what do you think of this? And they'd be like, no, this is too much. I'd be like, oh, come on, it's really funny. It was like, no, no, that's too much. And, and then you push a little bit, push a little bit, and then you would say, oh, well, then fine. Then we'll go with number one because, you know, that's funny. And they're yeah. like, number one, number one is, is, not, <laughs> is not funny. And I'm like, it, 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 I, I mean, I guess we'd go with two. And they'll be like, yes, we think two would be the best. And normally they would end up picking the one you wanted because A, it was the funniest. And B, they got their way. Or at least they right. thought they got their way. They made Jedi a decision. Mind yeah. They made a choice. decision. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but you you have to do that. You cannot, you cannot especially with, with the comedy stuff. Um, yep. You always had to have options, and I'm not necessarily talking about even a different read, but a different version of that joke, just so that when the person who was in charge would listen, couldn't, or at least wouldn't feel like they only had that option. They needed to have a decision, right? Yeah. So there, that was my that was my thing of threes, my my Jedi mind trick. W- were the, all these lines recorded, or is this just during the script? phase oh no they were recorded because we were in uh, the, the pressure to get the stuff done um and get it on air i mean working with um the amount of shows we had plus doing two networks at the same time of saturday morning cartoons meant that that stuff needed to get done yesterday so we would have them all on alternate tracks and and be able to pop them in so also you could play them i mean it's one thing to see them on paper it's another thing to play them as the performance if Mm -hmm. you really needed to sell it yeah so let's go back just a little bit because we jumped right into Dick Dick Van Dick. Yeah, and, cause, sorry. Because why not? I mean, it was there, you know. Yes. When, the, when the Dick yes. Dick Van Dick is there, you, <laughs> you can't ignore it. Um, so I, I know that you started as an audio engineer doing music in New York City. Uh, and that was sort of your entree into voiceover work and eventually to four kids. Can you just – let's give a like a, a – a primer on uh, your background, Eric. <laughs> All right. So here's the Reader's Digest condensed version of how Eric Stewart became a voice actor. So um, I was a musician first. Uh, I loved playing music uh, all through high school, and um, that's what I wanted to do. I also was uh, a pretty good tennis player. So I worked at a tennis club my whole life, um, and I was a tennis pro. And so um, one of the members at the tennis club 
found out that I was interested in audio. And I was 18 years old. And she said, um, we're uh, looking to hire a new assistant at our studio. Um, it's in New York. It's in the city. And, uh, and uh, I think you'd be a good fit. I was like, okay, great. And so I went to interview um, at this studio called Real to Real. And uh, it was a tiny little boutique kind of studio. It had, it had two rooms, a large room and a tiny, tiny little casting room. Um, it was run by two women. And they had one engineer and one other uh, person there that was the casting director. And so I went in there as um, the production assistant, which basically made, uh, I made coffee. Um, I took the trash out. I made, I made copies of scripts. And I had no idea that voiceovers were the thing that they primarily did. I thought they did music with a little bit of voiceovers. Um, of course, being a big cartoon fan, stuff like that, I knew that that was an industry, but it wasn't really what I was after at all. I wanted to learn about audio so that I could I could do more music. So I learned like the Karate Kid, you know, wax on, <laughs> wax off. I, it was like I was there doing all of the chores and just absorbing everything like a sponge. And I went from production assistant to assistant casting director to casting director to then engineer. I did a little bit of engineering, not much there, but I also then ran the studio for 10 years. So I was booking the, 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 the sessions and I was um, producing things for advertising clients that came in. And bit by bit during some of the casting sessions, um, let's say I had a two character radio commercial with a guy and a girl. I'd have people out there in the waiting room and maybe, you know, I'd pair them up because it would help everybody to read together. And I would get a call towards the end of my session. Hey, man, uh, that last guy that you were expecting. Yeah, he got a booking or he's sick. He's not going to make it. And there might be like a girl waiting to read with that person waiting in the waiting room. And I'd be like, well, why don't you come in? I'll read with you. So at least you have someone to play off of. But I wouldn't slate my name. You know, and for those of you who don't know what a slate is, I wouldn't go, this is Eric Stewart, take two. I wouldn't do that. I would just read. And the client would listen to the tape and say, hey, we really like girl number three, you know, Tara Sands. And uh, we like uh, the last guy, but he didn't say his name. And I'd say, well, that's just me. I'm just I'm just filling in. They're like, yeah, but we, we liked what you did. And so that sort of became uh, an issue. I didn't want to double dip. I didn't want to take the booking because I was also doing the casting. And... Then when I had an opportunity to actually go on tour as a musician, that's when I said to myself, after getting booked on a couple of these commercials and things like that, maybe voiceovers are the thing I can do where you don't see what I look like and I can do commercials for like Tidy Bowl um, as, you know, as a voiceover, but then sing Oh So Sensitive Love songs on stage as a rocker. But did you actually do Tidy Bowl? Now, now I need to know if that's actually true. No, 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 no. That just, was just I was, was definitely, I was just the Planters guy. I was the Planters guy. Yeah, I was a Planters peanut guy. I knew that. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, but it was, it was just one of those things where I kind of, I kind of fell into it, and it made a lot of sense as a singer um, using the same yeah. instrument, uh, you know, the voice, um, and and I loved being funny. That was, you know, my thing in school was like how I made friends was being funny. And so this was a great way to do comedy. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it was just, it was really, it was an accident. And, you know, 35 years later, this is what I do. So how, how did the uh, Pokemon audition happen? Well, I was, I was doing voiceovers for um, some of the anime that was going on in town, like for Slayers and things like that. For through, Central through Park Media. Central, exactly. Yeah. And uh, so I was in the little clique of people willing to do that weird work. Um, and one day I get a call from some of the people involved in, in those sh types of shows. And they said, hey, Eric, we'd like you to, we'd like you to come in and read a, um, a promo for a new thing we're working on. And I came in and all it was was one sentence. I think it was coming soon, Pokemon. And there were, I don't know, eight no or nine people No one knew how to say room. it. Yeah. <laughs> and no one knew how to say it. And the session should have taken about, I don't know, 15 minutes because I needed coffee and, and say hello to everybody. But the line would have only taken two seconds to record. But no, it was like... Uh, it was like at least an hour or something. And then I think I even came back a second day because they weren't quite sure of like, is it Pokemon or Pokemon or all of these things? And um, to this day, 
there's times I'm doing a panel with people that worked on it in different times and they mm-hmm. say it differently. Yep. And I'm like, I'm like, okay, whatever, as long as the check clears. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, so that that that's where I met uh, Norman and I, and I met Kathy and that was where we we did this this teaser for this new idea and then months went by until I got actually an audition for the show knowing that it was even a cartoon. I'm shocked that the teaser happened that far in advance of them casting the dub. It well, I think it, yeah, I don't think it was because they even knew where it was going to air. I don't know. Maybe they did. Or I would, don't know. Could it be that that was their tool to go pitch it? Like maybe that was maybe. For up not upfronts but something like that. Like that was a pitching It could have been. It could have been. It totally could have been as part of the package. Yeah, Norman did say in I don't. I think your interview might air before, as I'm not sure. Um, okay. That that so many people said no to it, so they did shop it to different networks, and that might have been mm. part of the package. That actually would Maybe. make sense. Yeah. Yeah, it could have been for the for the teaser for the for the pitch teaser. It could have been. Yep. How funny! So then you eventually get called to audition for Pokemon. Do you remember? Yes. Was that at? I know some auditions might have been at Jim's apartment. He said. Or... No, no <laughs> I, I think mine uh, were at Buttons. That's that's where most people had theirs. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. It was funny. I, I went into audition for uh, a, a bunch of roles for that show and I got none. So <laughs> so <laughs> I went home. Congratulations. And, You're nothing. For, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it was it's actually kind of funny. So so I, I you know, w- the, the business we're in. If you if you added up all the potential gigs <laughs> and the money that you would make, you would drive yourself completely insane. Don't ever so, do that. <laughs> so so uh, I I learned a long time ago in this in this part of my you know business that I actually make it a habit to forget everything I I have auditioned for yep. after <sighs> I leave the booth. Okay, so if you do call me afterwards, you'd be like, "Hey man, you got that thing?" I'm like, "Do you happen to have that thing recorded so that I can, or show me the script again?" Because if it was funny, I would say to like you know, I'd say to my wife, "Hey." I auditioned for this funny thing today. I played a blah, blah, blah. What's it for? I have no idea. I can't remember the product, right? Because I I would try to just put it out of my brain. So I auditioned for Pokemon and don't get anything. Go home. And I don't know, maybe a couple of weeks later, I get a phone call. Hey, and this is great. This is is our industry in a nutshell. Hey, Eric. Um, So the guy we cast is Brock. Yeah, we don't like him. Um... So we want you. You're our second choice. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> You're number two. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, all right. And so so then I went in and I was Brock. Um, but then uh, our dear friend uh, Ted, Ted Lewis, who was playing James <laughs> yep. in the beginning, um, w- w- decided to do more theater stuff and was going to you know, leave the show. So I, I think it's after episode five or seven or something like that. Um, I was brought in to voice match. And- the funniest part about that was Michael would say, no, no, no. Team Rocket's supposed to be really serious. Um, they're supposed to be really, like, legit. They're the bad guys. And I'm like, I, I think this is all the comedy relief. I think having him read this flat is, like, we're missing some of the comedy here. Um, and so I think in that episode, the first one I was dubbing, I was in drag. And so that's when I added some of the funnier laughing oh. and the, and all of the the Ed Wynn stuff that I that I I gladly say that's where I borrow it from. Um, all of that stuff, the silliness, came from after we sort of were given permission to be a little bit more funny. Um, you know the 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 characters. Re- I mean, I listen to some of the early stuff every once in a while, and mm. I'm like, oh my goodness, what were we doing? Hey, um, thank and, you for saying. And sa- then it became natural. Yeah, well, I I say that too. Gosh, uh, and uh, and not every actor feels that way, so I'm very careful with how I say it. But when I watch the early stuff of myself specifically, I'm like, oh, there's me learning how to dub. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, and also there's me learning that character, the the nuance. Yeah, I mean, yeah. later on, I mean, once I was also direct, you know, I I ended up directing myself a lot on Pokemon right. as well as some of the other actors. Um, but once it became very clear that the characters were sort of defined, um, and other writers were given the job to write for us or other directors, there were definitely times that. We as the characters would say, or we as the actors who played these characters would say, you know, James wouldn't really say it like that. Like he kind of would do it like this. Right. And, and I'm not I'm not suggesting to be a diva with every session, but there was definitely more continuity later 
Um, and a lot of that was because we as the actors were like, mm, nah, yeah. Um, one of the little things that James, that I, I did with James was he didn't contract things. He, he you know, it right. would be, you know, cannot. It wouldn't be can't. It just wasn't, you know, upscale enough or snotty enough. When, when did you decide that you also wanted to work behind the scenes there? Like when did it just happen naturally or was that a very clear decision in your mind? Like, okay, being an actor, I, I figured this out. I'd also like to do something else at this company. So I had already been directing a lot um, at the at the at Real to Real. I would I was directing a lot of the sessions, directing a lot of New York's finest voice actors, uh, you know, um, stage actors that would come in and do projects. I mean, a lot of the celebrities. So I I'd had that uh, experience under my belt, and when I was offered. Um, this role, I also was auditioning for, you know, commercials and things like that during the day. So I did not want to dub nine to five. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted to work six to nine. That was, I was like, I want to work in the evening. Um, and so in the beginning of that, it was, well, we have an engineer that's willing to work with you, but I don't know if the director wants to stay that late. And the, the early seasons, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but as, as, as the show went on and it almost was an autopilot, um, I got the permission like, OK, Eric is directing some of the other actors in the evening, uh, you know, because they asked me to do that. Yeah. Um, and then they were like, well, and you can direct yourself. So right. that was kind of because I wanted those days free for for other things. Yeah. And then totally. they after after doing that, when when the, when four kids started to bring everything in house um, or at least with Yu-Gi-Oh, um, they called me and said, hey, would you like to uh, interview for a staff position here? Um, directing a new show. And that's where the choice was, okay, you know, I, I, I had kids, I had little kids. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, you know, this is a little bit more stable. There's health insurance, all of that stuff. Um, let me interview for this job and I can still do my dubbing for Pokemon in the evenings. So I'll, you know, I'll, I'll and I'll work from 10 to five or whatever. And then it's only a couple blocks away. This could, this could right. be good. Um, but I will say I also had some uh, uh, parameters to my hiring. Um, uh, I needed to have the ability to run out to auditions. Yeah. And I also needed to have the ability to, if I got a booking, to move my sessions around. Um, and, and that's one of the wonderful things about uh, Norman uh, there was he basically was like, if you get the show done on time and under budget, I don't care what you're doing. Just right. Get it done. Know, get it. Get it done and get it done well. And I'm like, I will never sacrifice the quality of what I'm doing for the craziness of my life of running around New York City like a madman. Yeah. Racing between things. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, and I had I had assistant directors that could cover for me. And, and it was that was wonderful in those times. But um, it was crazy. I, you know, directing during the day, running around doing auditions and, and, and commercial bookings during the day and then going and dubbing Pokemon in the evening. And you were still I want to I don't want to forget you were still playing with a band at this time because exactly. that was a was great excuse doing for the, the cast to all get together. It was awesome that you, both you and Jim yeah. were in bands and it was like this built in social life for a lot of the cast. And again, yeah. that's like we talk about the New York of this time period and the four kids offices in general and how like. Yep. Well, it being in New York led to so many things and led to these friendships because you'd walk to the subway together or whatever it was mm -hmm. that it just doesn't happen everywhere else. Um, no, no, so that was special. And, and, and these are special. I mean, you know, I, I include you in this list. I mean, these are special relationships. Um, you know, you, you work through this yeah. stuff. You work on on popular shows, both the good, the bad, the roller coasters of this industry. Um, you know, it is it is rare to have so many um, people that uh, are basically competing, right? You know, for for work, who are actually yeah. friends and do champion each other. Yeah, that kind of schedule. I don't think you could do it in any other city besides New York, because no. <laughs> for people no. that aren't aware, that... there's usually a subway stop within blocks of wherever you are. And then there's con there's connections at many different points. It mm -hmm. seems confusing. But like when you were describing that, I put together, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's doable. <laughs> that's doable yeah. in New York. Yeah. And most <laughs> of the studios we were dealing with, you know, unless you had to go downtown, which was a, a drag, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're talking like 14th Street up to like 42nd yep. Street. And then. Yep. And that and, you know, and 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 the the square that you're running in, um, you know, you can get those subways and, and you can run down those streets. But my goodness, 
for someone who, you know, wasn't going to the gym, I was in great shape because I was racing through uh-huh. New York City, um, you know, sometimes in it like with a bag over my shoulder, sweating. and Oh, and then I was also doing the Letterman stuff. What so you, I had a regular Letterman? gig. I was I was one of the, I guess, 10 member regular uh, uh, comedy uh, voiceover guys oh, for the Letterman show. OK. And so I was on hold every uh, was it like Monday, Tuesday and Thursday? It was like three days a week from 12 to two. So I had to leave that time available and I would get the call whether they wanted me right. at like 1115. And um, it was all based on the writers presenting the jokes to Dave. And if he liked them, they had each one of us for the different styles of joke. I was like the young guy that would do like a Burger King spoof, right? Um, or or something like that where, um, you know, the great like uh, Rob Webb, who was doing 60 Minutes for Real, was the newscaster guy. And JR, like, so we all had our thing that we did. So if you got that joke picked, then you were like, well, that's an Eric spot. And then I would run up to Letterman and go do that and then come back. That's that was so as crazy. far uptown as I really had to run. Um, and then, you know, and there was th- there was no way I wasn't going to be available for that. Of course. That's oh, that's so interesting. Uh, but I guess we should talk about four kids um, because I, could, I have so many other tangents I could go on with you. Uh, yeah. Sorry. No, don't be sorry. It's that's why we're, why we're here. Uh, yeah. So during that Pokemon time. I, and I guess this is a question because I was not aware of all the changes happening to Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! and all the, all these shows. There was no, I mean, we weren't Googling this stuff. No one was writing to us on Twitter asking why we changed something. Were mm-hmm. you aware as, until you were really fully working there all the time, when you were an actor and starting to direct, did you know about all this stuff going on? Change You're talking about changing uh, actual the the full story or yeah, changing like, things like um, the like the food products and things like the American exa- mm-hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, um, I was aware of it because um, I had worked on other sort of projects that were from different countries, you know, even in the narration world and things like that, where you, when you're trying to make something more universal, you have to look at these things and say, well, this is too specific to that region, that country, whatever. Mm-hmm. The This, the marketing, the tie-ins to all of the, the food products and things like that, like all of the, you know, the fast food companies and things like that, um, it made sense. Um, some of them were very weird. Um <laughs> And, and we and of course they're memes and people make fun of them, which is great. Yeah. I mean, I, I you know I, I laughed when I did them, um, but I understood it. Yeah. Now, in terms of the storylines, um, a lot of anime is very dark, um, and 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 even if the visual isn't, what's going on in the dialogue is. Um, right. Also, jokes and things like that are so regional. Yeah. My goodness, I remember doing some things where we have the Japanese uh, client in the room and they were pushing for like a literal translation of a joke. And we're like, guys, it's only <laughs> funny in Japanese. Yeah. Like it, it, the, the pun doesn't work in English. Like it's not funny. Yeah. Um, but it's very hard to explain that. Could you remember any shows like that off the top of your head working that closely with the, the Japanese clients? Oh my goodness! There's, I mean, I, I, my role at Four Kids was I pretty much. There's some shows that I would choose to not work on, or I was not asked to work on. Um, but I, I primarily would like launch a show, work on it for a little while, and then turn it over and move on to the next show. I, I was kind of like a, you know, because I was a senior voice director there, I started up a lot of projects. Yeah. Um, Sometimes it was a drag that I'd have to move on to something else because I really liked working on it. And sometimes it was um, a drag to have to work on that show. Um, So there were so many times that we'd have uh, clients either stop by or get notes from them. Um, But uh, the majority, I would say, was nice. The majority would be like we're doing a little show and tell, a little dog and pony show for them. They'd come in and watch us dub and... um, you know, they'd see the way we work and, and, and how much we got done and the quality of, of what we were doing. So that was fun. But, you know, some of the video game projects with with a with the client sitting in the room, you know, from Japan as we are dubbing the game and trying to convince them that they're the you know, the, the dialogue, the, the transliteration um, is not the way people speak. 
Um, that yeah. was that's hard because you you don't want to offend, but you also know that you don't want it to you know be put out there in the world and it sounds like garbage because at the end of the day, who do you blame for that? The actor. You don't <laughs> right. blame you don't blame the production company. Sometimes you do, but you don't, but most of the time it's like I can't believe you read the line that way or like that was the dumbest thing. What were you thinking? I'm right. like uh, I was thinking about the paycheck and getting to the next session. Yeah. Um, yeah. If that's what we they wanted go. me yeah. to say, <laughs> yeah. But also well, yeah. explaining uh, to the Japanese the difference between their standards and practices and our standards and practices mm-hmm. and what is appropriate for children here is different from what their children watch. And that's yes. kind of a hard thing to say to somebody. <laughs> yeah. And Saturday morning cartoons in, in America have very different rules than the rest of BSMP. I mean, just that the hours of that of that day um, are very strict. And you have to put a piece of educational programming in that same lineup. That was part of the contract. So um, and then we had to try to figure out a, which one of our anime things would be considered educational. You know, do they talk about math in Yu-Gi-Oh! GX? Okay, great. There you go. You got that covered. <laughs> but just uh, dialing back a little bit to what you were just talking about, it's, you know, I I, I sympathize because, yeah, unfortunately, the actors were kind of more of the, you know, the public face of these shows. So I, <laughs> it's, yeah. It, yeah. I, I said, I, I feel bad that you guys maybe, or probably till this day, maybe still have to deal with that when, Half the time, these choices were not yours. <laughs> but... Yeah, and I do explain during the Q and A's at the conventions. I I usually get that question asked to me, and I, I will explain that the people behind those decisions were not the creatives. Um, so it makes a little. Sometimes they're like, "Oh, that makes total sense," and sometimes they still want to blame me, but it's fine. I don't. Yeah, care. and on the flip side, we're also the ones getting the thank yous for work that of we course. really didn't do. So <laughs> and it far outweighs yeah. the the yeah the negatives. Yeah. Stuff. Yes, and of course, everybody's going to give you their opinion about something, right? You know, they have to do that. It's very hard for somebody to watch anything or or digest any art and then not give you feedback. You know? (laughs) Yeah. 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 So I remember it may be my memory is wrong is as Yu-Gi-Oh! The first show that you were kind of with from the from day one. Yes, I was brought on to be the director of Yu-Gi-Oh! That was my my first job in the four kids building. Mm -hmm. Um as as the as a like on staff director that was my job um and of, of course i was brought in all of the other um actors had been cast i except for kaiba right. i was the i so i'm brought in to direct the show and they play me the first episode and my line was oh this is pokemon 90210 <laughs> and and they were like, "What?" I'm like, "Yeah, all the kids that are that have outgrown Pokemon. Yeah. This is what they'll watch next. Mm-hmm. It's like it's like Pokemon in high school." And they're like, "Oh, I didn't really think of it that way, but yeah, that kind of makes sense because it's look, the, reinventing the wheel is silly. There, there is a there is definitely a science to this. All of the characters." You have to be redeemable in some way. There has to be something relatable that, you know, even the the worst villain, there's something like, well, why is he doing this, yeah. right, um, in these shows? So whether you're like the quirky best friend or the funny bad guys or whatever, there's something for someone, right? Um, and that's what Yu-Gi-Oh! did, which is what Pokemon did. It's just, you know, get the holograms instead of, you know, Pokeballs with, with you know, creatures popping out of them. Um, but they didn't have Ka- uh, Kaiba cast yet. And I did not want to walk in there and say, well, hey, thank you so much for hiring me as the voice director of the show. You know that I could play the, uh, the, one of the main characters, you know? So I, I didn't. And so I had to audition many of my friends, your, your friends and mine, uh, for that role. And I read a ton of our but go-to. You, but you made them all read it with a lisp, Eric. And I did. I did. I asked it. for the Buddy Hackett <laughs> lateral lisp. I actually asked for someone that. That's what I really wanted. I wish um, that was true. <laughs> that would have been great, it right? Would have been very because I wasn't even thinking. I wasn't even thinking because I I was working on a lot of other shows. I mean, you know, I how much more did I really need at that moment? Because I I felt very comfortable yeah. with the amount of stuff that I was doing for Pokemon. Um, so I'm I'm trying to find the 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 right voice for this character and uh, Lloyd uh, Goldfine was the producer for this particular show, and Lloyd would listen and go. 
Yeah, no, not hearing it yet. Not hearing it yet. And at the same time, we were doing promos for coming soon to the Kids WB Yu-Gi-Oh! And I would say, not if we don't find the voice of Kaiba. <laughs> um, so we got to figure this out. So it's going on and on, and we do all this casting, all this casting. Still, uh, n- nobody is, is who Lloyd is looking for. And uh, Joe Shalek, who uh, we call Joe Vegas, one of the main engineers up there, turned to me once during the end of a casting session, and he said... Eric, why don't you read for this? And I'm like, Joe, I'm the director of the show. I don't think it's going to really look too good if I, you know, submit myself. And he goes, but this is probably a role you could do. And I'm like, oh, I totally could play this role. I I said, "I, I know what Lloyd is looking for. And it's not the voice that he's looking for. It's the attitude he's looking for. I get it. It's the douchebag. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. And so and so I, I, you know, we're getting close to, you know, to the air date. And Lloyd comes in and I said, look, hey, I've got a, I've got an idea. How about I dub half the show as Kaiba? You listen to it. If you hate it, we start from scratch again and I'll and I'll start looking mm-hmm. for more and more people. If you like it, we're 50 percent to uh, completing this for our air date. And he goes, all right, we got a deal. Now, Lloyd didn't know me as a voice actor. Like when I was hired there, oh, okay. uh, he, he was also brought on. So like it wasn't like we had a history. It would have been a little different if I, mm-hmm. you know, if Michael Hegney was the was the uh, producer of that yeah, show. Because then yeah. I, then he might have even said, hey, why don't Eric, why don't you read for this? Um, but so then I did half the show. He comes in. I think we played three or four lines. And he said, that's exactly what I wanted. He <laughs> walks out. Joe Shalek turns around and says, Eric. You couldn't have done that like a month ago, so maybe we could have had a lunch break. <laughs> yeah. Hey there, I'm Jordan Morris. I'm a writer and podcaster. You might know me from the Jordan Jesse Go podcast or various skits and bits on Good Mythical Morning. Uh, I have a new graphic novel coming in 2024, and you can pre order it now. Youth Group is a YA horror comedy written by me and illustrated by the great Bowen McGurdy. It's the story of a bunch of goofy teenage exorcists trying to navigate their teen years while fighting back a demonic invasion. Recommended for fans of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Shaun of the Dead, or Riverdale, you can pre-order Youth Group on Amazon, at Barnes & Noble, or at your local indie bookstore. If you want to check out some art from Youth Group and get some pre-order links, go to bit.ly slash youthgroupbook. That's bit.ly slash youthgroupbook. Thank you. You are amazing. So Yu-Gi-Oh! starts. Now, if you're like me, I don't know what's going to be a hit and what's not. Did you feel like this was like a surefire success, like the Pokemon 90210, where you're like, this is, this is the next big one? I was confident that it would be at least something we would continue working on for a while. And I think, because of the way my brain works, I also saw that there was product. Many of the shows we worked on were great, but had no toy deals. They had no cards. They had nothing that would keep the machine rolling. Mm -hmm. This already was established as a well-known card game, uh, talks of video game stuff, all of that. So that made me think, okay, these 20-minute commercials is what really these shows are, um, you know, are actually good shows. So if you have, I think, because I thought the cast was great, and I'm not just saying that about my performance. I thought the cast was great. The writing was super solid. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and the music was cool and the, and the, and the images were cool. I thought the only way this will get canceled is if there's no toy deal, right. which is some of the shows that we worked on. I mean, I what, think you don't have all that Tama and friends merch <laughs> or the, yeah, the cubics <laughs> toys that broke in your hands. Um, oh. yeah, yeah, right. Um, but yeah, I, so, so I had a good feeling about it. Now I had no idea that it would be like very close to the success of a, of a Pokemon. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it would be a decent show. And especially because it was on network television, it had a you know, definitely more potential for a wider audience. Um, but I felt pretty good about it. Um, yeah, I, you know, and I directed the first three seasons before I turned it over. Uh, uh, I think at that time I, I turned it over to Darren Dunstan or, and then Chris Collet di- directed some stuff. Um, I would have liked to have stayed 
directing that story arc rather than moving on to another show because it was so even though I was yeah. dubbing I was still I still played the role um, and I got to direct the movies um, which was fun but um, you know that was that was a lot of fun to do that you know from from episode one or the or episode uh, two because we never right really we never did right one. and now like I'm looking because I'm looking at the, like the list of everything because we can't possibly talk about it all but during this time like so many other shows were going on there I mean Kirby was during this time yep one piece started not that long after that uh Yep. F- fighting Foodons, uh, Ultimate Muscle, which we talked a little bit about already. Uh, there's like too much to cover. Is there anything before we like move on to something else that you have memories of of those shows? Anything funny? Anything? Yep. Please share. Oh, it. Well, I, <laughs> if 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 you're talking about um, like maybe a show you left off that list, which was my most satisfying oh. project. What is Viva Pinata? Oh, <laughs> yes, of course. Because that was the first time I got to direct a prelay show. Um, Explain what and, prelay is to the people who don't know. Yes. <laughs> so this is where we record the voices first, assemble the dialogue, and the animators work to that. Rather than the other way around, which we're doing our dub, our ADR, we are matching lip flaps. So the animation is already set, and now we have to force that line to fit into whatever that picture looks like. That was before I, you know, Ninja Turtles? After. Well, I... It was after I was on Turtles, but I didn't direct. Oh, you didn't direct I got Turtles. To, I see. Okay. I got no. I got to direct uh, Viva Pinata, and what was amazing was, um, th- they took a team of like sitcom writers. Like mm-hmm. we had a writers' room, and they were standalone episodes. It was like working on a Seinfeld thing. It was so much fun, and there was no rules in terms of what the show could be about. Yeah. As long as it had these characters in it, we could do it. It's crazy. So there was one where we went after the Abominable Snowman, and we went, went one where we, um, we were like uh, going to space, and whatever it was, we would create this environment for that one episode. And being able to record each actor individually, never in the booth together like they did with Turtles, I recorded each actor individually and then assembled their dialogue as if they were talking to each other. Now, the, that job required one director, not two or three, because mm-hmm. I might record the actor that's delivering the punchline, yeah. but I know what I'm going to ask the actor that delivers the straight line to do, and, I, and, and vice versa. So I, I know both sides of the dialogue, even if only one half has been recorded. Mm-hmm. Right? Even if that actor brings something different to the party, and even if I don't play them that line, there has to be I know one I, person there throughout it all. Yes, mm-hmm. you have to have one chef to glue that is, it together. Is, oh, yeah. yeah, yes, and so some of the performances in that show are they're so much fun. I mean, we we could do any voice we wanted to, and there were yeah. there were times where it was celebrity impersonations and all. I mean, at one point we had a bunch of penguins who were the Beatles, and I got to play Ringo. <laughs> And George, you know, so right, it's like right. it, it was so much so fun. Much fun, you know, that makes me think. And again, you're one of the few actors that I can talk to about this because I, I think you and I have a sense of humor about all this stuff. Um, mm-hmm. I think as time went on, the the performances in so many of these shows got better and better. And you know, Steve was is, is somebody who knows a lot about four kids and grew up you know liking some things, hating some things. And there is right. there is a lot of stuff out there that. Is not complimentary to the to a stylistic voice acting approach to some of these shows. What do you? Right. I'm, I'm trying to figure out where that. Do you think? And in my mind, I was doing my version of anime dub voice for some of these projects because I thought right. that's what it was. And again, we didn't have access to anime. We didn't. You know, we weren't fans of it yet, so we didn't know. Like, what do you? How do you? react to that when people say that to you or ask you about that the stylistic choices is that is that the right so, way to phrase it i mean i don't yeah <laughs> no i get what you're saying so so i actually was a huge fan of battle of the planets um g-force mm-hmm. which was on um american television when i was growing up and that was my first introduction to real sort of anime mm-hmm. and um in fifth grade I could impersonate Casey Kasem, who <laughs> was the main character right. um, in uh, Battle of Planets. And so my friends and I, we were all run around and play uh, G-Force. And I would do that voice all the time. So when I was asked to read for Brock, that's exactly who I did. 
So my my connection was, oh, oh this yeah. is an anime. I'm going to be a, like a higher register Casey Kasem, which is what he did with Shaggy, but with less pot. Um, uh, and that's what Brock is. I mean, that's who he is. Yeah, that's, I've, yeah. That's who I borrowed it from. So, um, it, you know, so many of the characters that, that at least I was doing that I that I'm proud of, um, accent wise, things like that, um, were just things that made sense to me for some of these characters. But as a lot of the production notes would be, this guy should be Southern, this guy should be British, this guy should be whatever. And, and I explain this in another way based on the original Japanese. A lot of times you could not recognize or uh, d- differentiate the voices of different characters in the original mm-hmm. because they're all 15 year old boys and sometimes they're even performed by the same Japanese actor. And so in the other room, you wouldn't know who was necessarily speaking. Yeah. It seemed like for the American audience, we wanted you to know who was speaking even when you weren't in front of the television. So if you heard Joey with his Brooklyn accent, if you heard, you know, uh, I played a bastion with a British accent. If you heard these guys who were mm-hmm. all in school together, Right. How do you differentiate like, you know, five 15 year old boy actors uh, or characters on a show? You give them a dialect. Mm -hmm. Are some of them kind of stupid? Yeah, there's definitely (laughs) some choices that were made where you're like, why? But um, and it just as a side note to the accent thing. So when I was asked to audition for Meta Knight in Kirby, Mm -hmm. they asked me to do my Clint Eastwood voice. And I said, well. That register is kind of what I do with Kaiba, even though he's not a Clint Eastwood impersonation that's in the same register. And and Meta Knight has no lip flap. He's just a helmet. So can't I basically do anything? And they were like, yeah. I said, well, can I be uh, Antonio Banderas? And Michael <laughs> said, why, why would he be Spanish? And I said, well, why wouldn't he be yeah. Spanish? And so they let me be Antonio Banderas. And this is before Puss in Boots, thank you. I So, <laughs> so I say that Antonio is playing me playing him. Um, but... Years later, when I first started doing conventions, I was in Miami and a group of young men came up to me and said, hey, are you the voice of Meta Knight on Kirby? And I said, yeah. And they said, we just want to thank you. You were one of the few cartoon characters that sounded like us that didn't make fun of us. Hmm. And I never thought of it that way, but there was so much of the stereotypical, the cliche stuff you know, decisions that were made and not always by the actor, um, not always by the director. It just was like, that's what they want. Um, And that's another issue with a lot of the different countries and regional things. There are things that are very, very offensive that are in America that are not so much in Japan. When you say that's what Um, they want, are you referring to the producers? Are you referring to... Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes it's the producers. Sometimes, you know, that's the, the idea they have. I mean, I can't point a finger at right. anybody in particular for this sort of stuff. But I will say that sometimes it it feels like because it's multi levels away from the audience, there's no there's no sort of connection to that. Yeah. That sometimes without getting like into PC stuff, sometimes I mean Bugs Bunny is one of the most, you know, there there's there are episodes that kids don't ever see anymore because they're completely racist. Um right. That was the time, unfortunately. Um, And Bugs Bunny is a lot of propaganda during the war. That's what it was. But there were things that we were doing that were that had to be removed because the the Japanese, it didn't bother them. Yeah. I mean, you know, Jinx in in Pokemon is is a very offensive, you know, character in America. They didn't understand why that was a problem. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) And that's just cultural differences and. Yeah, 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 and that's and that's why you know we do try to uh, make it more universal, make it more acceptable. You know, you can't please everybody all the t- you know all the time, yeah. but you, you just got to make sure that you don't offend, especially because that show was then redubbed in multiple multiple countries. Right, and then sometimes... and the images didn't change. God, that's so interesting. I mean, the one I get asked about the most, and again, I know this wasn't one that you did a lot of work on, was One Piece. They're like, there's there, there's a lot of why questions in One Piece. It's not necessarily like, this is good or bad. It's why. Like, So I, w- I was in an early meeting when we decided to do One Piece, and I actually said, why are we doing the show for children? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's got like swords and all this stuff. I said, we're, and we're going to have to just cut this thing up to, to, to ribbons. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like- that show became just 
you know, and I don't blame the actors. I don't blame the directors. It's like, guys, like it's a it was a cool property, but it should have gone straight to cable. Yeah. And it and then it did it. Then it then it got the treatment. Yeah. That it, I mean, not it, every it show yeah. just because it's successful in another country is right for Saturday morning cartoons. You know, like I said, nothing against the team that worked on it. Yeah. More of the the higher ups that go let's turn this into a you know it's like yeah i don't know i don't know if like you know um, but there were even like you know, the, weird decisions the walking dead should be a saturday morning cartoon you know <laughs> but like but like steve and steve and i talked about this in the intro a little bit with the uncut versions of some stuff that got made which we do have questions about but i know steve and i sometimes there's talk about there's there's things on one piece that got changed that there's no explanation for like you're like okay well that no. wasn't offensive but like there was something with a whale or like right see yeah like storylines like, being cut out and you know there's a scene okay. in one piece i remember dubbing like some walla for for chris there's a scene where people are up on crucifixes across an entire field <laughs> and they had to give that to the art department to turn them into um like cat's eyes right so they were diamonds <laughs> oh. right mm -hmm. But they're still hanging up there. I'm like, that's uh, come on now. We know what <laughs> that cream is. Whipped cream on the whatever. Like right. you're you're you, you. That's not you know. You're not masking anything there. Like <laughs> that scene can't be there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is America. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, it's cr I mean, even you know when we spoke to Norman, he said it just shouldn't have happened. It, you know, he was yeah, not involved. It's... I, I want to know who chose to license it because Norman said he was not involved in that process. I, I don't think he was involved in that at all. Yeah, no. I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I have I have many theories on why certain things failed there, but uh, yeah, but you can ask me whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uncut dubs. We've brought this up with a few people, and like a, a, Tara, Tara herself too doesn't recall these at all. But there was a point where Yu Gi Oh and Shaman King, there was uncut dubs produced, totally re recorded. Um, and that I don't know, I know next to nothing. I don't know why they ended, but I don't even know. Uh, you know there, there wasn't even any proper credits. So I was curious if you were directing the uncut Yu-Gi-Oh. Oh, no, no. I was not involved in directing any of that stuff. By the time they got around to that, I don't even know if I was living in New York anymore. Wow. I might have even dubbed that remotely if I had to do a couple of lines, probably not even looking at what I was doing. Um, you know, there, that, that's almost kind of like uh, last hurrah. Let's let's do something with these episodes and, mm -hmm. and sort of appease people. Yeah, that's um, exactly yeah, what it was. Yeah, yeah, and 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 uh, yeah, I, yeah. I don't, but I really don't even remember doing that. Like, either do it the way it was written, or do it the way you rewrote it. Don't do it. It's somewhere in between. Mm. These were these DVDs that were released were true adaptations. Like they were true, um, right? Uncut, right. uncensored, which. I did find an interview with Al Khan talking about it. He was like, these are for the the fans. And I think, honestly, they just didn't make enough money. And that was really yeah, the bottom. Probably I mean, what happened. Yeah. yeah. What else can we do? It's like, oh, look, we'll put these shoes out in pink. Today. Yeah. That's like what we're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to we've got. Yeah. We've got some pink paint lying around. Let's put that on there and see if that'll that'll fly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't remember. But I know that I wasn't involved in directing that at all. Yeah. I mean, and, and we should also touch on because I know you and I have spoken about things like this on panels the frustrations of working at 4Kids. It wasn't, I mean, we felt very lucky to have jobs. We had mm -hmm. really fun jobs. But, you know, financially, it, for the how big these shows were, we weren't yeah. always treated well. I know you did some naughty things when you worked there. Yeah, uh, definitely. <laughs> can we go into that a little bit? Sure, sure. I have, I have no. I'm an old man. I, I just turned fifty six like like last week. I'm good. I'm good. I'm, yeah, I, I, I'm vested. I'll get my pension. That's I'm exactly good. That's right. <laughs> Let's go there. Okay. So yes, we signed a crappy contract. We all know that. Mm -hmm. Um, but. Did you, I mean, I know that there were days I left that that studio and I would look at how fast they were growing and how well they were doing. And I would go, why are they still paying me this? Or did yeah, that lead yeah. to your frustration as well? Well, in the very beginning, I did help make some of the uh, suggestions to a couple of the talent contracts. Um, in the very beginning, I wanted us to get paid every time we started a, uh, like a different show. 
Yeah. If you booked us for an hour and you walked into one room and said one line as a fix and then you went into the next room, you got it, treating each show as its own uh, um, thing, right? Mm-hmm. Its own entity. Um, that's how it started. Then everyone was like, oh, no, 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 no. We're spending too much money. And the reason we were spending too much money is because so many times scripts weren't ready. So many times... Um, People had to be brought back because scripts were not ready and people were reading temporary lines and mm-hmm. then they'd have to be brought back in to do it. So budgets were ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that when you uh, interview uh, the lovely Brenda, she will tell you or she might not remember. But we had a conversation once where she asked me, she said, Eric, can you tell me why your uh, your dubbing schedule and the hours that you use in the studio is like um, one third of what everyone else is doing in terms of budget? And I said, because... When I get something that I want from an actor, I move on. Mm-hmm. Well, and you and, and Sean Conrad worked very quickly together. You guys had yeah, a Sean, great system going. It would be like, hey, we've got so-and-so scheduled for two hours tomorrow. Am I going to get the script? No. Then I'm going to reschedule them. Well, we'll have them come in and, and I'll feed you the script. when. No. No. I'll do something else. Mm-hmm. We'll do something else. We're not doing that. Yeah. Um, so that was that was the most frustrating thing. Also, with, then when the contract you know changed that way. But... Um, yeah, you know, be, because I had so much uh, freedom there. I mean, thanks to Norman and his and his trust in me. Um, I, you know, I wasn't hurting because I was doing three jobs at once. You know, I was on staff. I was doing my, you know, my Letterman stuff and my commercial stuff, and I was dubbing for the shows mm-hmm. that I was on. So, you know, yes, if it was only dubbing for them, it would be impossible to. Uh, not only appreciate, you know, <laughs> what I'm getting, but also live on it. Um, so that was definitely a, a hard thing to deal with. And I, and I, you know, and I, I tried to give my people as much work as I could, um, even when it was, oh, well, there's, you know, just some Wallace stuff, some, some crowd stuff. All right, I'll bring in so-and-so, give them a couple of hours because I haven't seen them in a little while. You know, I had certain uh, um, uh, freedom to do that. Uh, I didn't have to audition people for stuff like that. And at least I could get them some, you know, some some income. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one night you're working late and you decide you're going to throw some stuff into an episode of Pokemon that was not there before. (laughs) Yeah. I'm egging you on because you said you would talk about this. So, yeah, no, I'll tell you. You you want to, I'll give you the lead up. So, (laughs) one of the things that we benefited from was when they used our Pokemon sounds, like Squirtle or Bulbasaur, things like that. They would use them in commercials for like Burger King and network commercials, paying union scale with residuals and all of that. Mm -hmm. And what that would do, it would pay for my health insurance for me and my family yep. because the other stuff was not taking care of that. And you had to earn, I think at that time, it was $15,000 a year to have one of the best health care um, you know, plans ever. Mm-hmm. And I had, as I said, I had little kids. Um, you know, th- th- the, there was no, there wasn't really a health care plan uh, at four kids for us. Um, and this was my way of taking care of my kids. So... One evening, I'm there uh, recording, and I learn that they have lifted, meaning stolen, the sounds, made a library of all of the little reacts we do, and given them to the advertising company to use in their commercials from that point on. For free. Now, for nothing. For yes. free. So what really made me mad was the lowest person... On right, the lowest person on on on, in, on the totem pole, right? You are saying we don't want you to make this money. It didn't come out of four kids' budget. Exactly. Budget. It didn't. Yeah. It didn't come out of Taj's budget. What it was was a kind of here's a freebie mm-hmm. for all the work you're giving us. Thank you so much, and you can screw over the the actors. And so by doing that, one commercial would get me that 15 grand that would cover my health care for my family. Yeah. I was so furious that while I was recording and I was not directing myself, um, James is attacked by a victory bell. And I said, Leo Burnett, the advertising company, and four kids are the devil. And I said it in character 
and I did it as this wacky thing as I was being <laughs> uh, attacked. And I did it pretty much as an outtake. I mean, one of the things about doing outtakes or when you mess up or you go into a profanity, you know, laced rant, you have to stay in character. So that's why some that's of the stuff that Joe has, it. Yeah, that's yeah, what's yeah. funny. The yeah. minute you drop the character and you're just Eric doing it, and that's the, then it's just me yelling it like a cab driver. Um, it's much funnier if it's, if it's James with, with uh, you know, doing that stuff. Much so funnier. I said that and, and Jim as a joke messing around with Pro Tools took it, flipped it in reverse. So it played backwards and put it in and we laughed. Ha ha ha. Very funny. And that was the last I knew of it until it aired. Uh, and some kid had heard it. A kid's dad and, heard it. Yeah. 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 And played it and realized it was backmasking and played it backwards to hear it forwards and heard what it was. And <laughs> <laughs> Jim and I got called into the principal's office, which was now four kids had two locations. It had the uptown office, which was like the licensing people and all, you know, uh, you know, that, that's sort of like the, you know, all of the suits and ties. And then the downtown office or the midtown office, which was all of the production people. So the that's creatives. where I normally was. Yeah. Right. The creative. So I got called uptown with Jim. We sat down in in a meeting uh, with Norman and who and Michael. It was the two of them, and it was me and Jim. I can't. And they and they said, "So you did this thing," and we were like, and I'm like looking at Jim, going, and we of course we rode up there together, going like, "What? What are we in trouble for? What did we do?" And then when they told us, we were like, "I'm like, dude, you, you put that in the sh- oh, I didn't, <laughs> like I didn't realize you put that in the show, right?" And so they were like, okay, well, to get the master back and remake the master, it's going to be, I think it was $1,000 each, like they fined us. And I went, (laughs) okay. And so we paid it. And to this day, I will tell you right now, and I'm not a wealthy man, I would do it again. (laughs) It was based on principle. I was so, I was so just like, guys, why would you take something like this and give it away for free when they weren't, you know, they, they, were, weren't, they weren't billing you. They weren't complaining that it was too expensive. They, es- they yeah. expected it. Yeah. They expected it. Yeah. Like they, they were like, we're going to give this bill to Burger King and Burger King is going to go, oh, these guys each make uh, $15,000 for this, this uh, squirtle, squirt, squirtle. No problem. Yeah. We'll make that up that like in three seconds, if not more. <laughs> if that, not less. that money, that commercial money changed my life back then. Yeah. Yeah, it did. Yeah. It was the first time I ever sa- was able to save money as a person yep. living in New York City and paying rent. And I f- finally got ahead. Like it, yeah. it was life changing. After being on a hit TV show for many years, suddenly I was able to save money. And it was a, and yep. I get your frustration and I. Under, I, I mean, I think it's hilarious that you did it, but I also think it's hilarious that you didn't get fired. You called the company you work for the devil and no one <laughs> fired you, Eric. Like, I can't. That is insanity. Yeah, I know. I mean, you know, it says a lot about them, though. Well, first of all, I think it's it says okay, these people are valuable to our company. It says a lot about your skill set that they were like, we can't lose them. <laughs> well, and I think we, we also explained why we did it. Yeah. And we didn't do it, we, we did, at least I know that I didn't do it to air. I didn't do it thinking it was going to air. Right. I did it to vent. Um, right. And there's a, there's many things in many of those sessions that should never even be played to people. <laughs> Um, but, but, you know, that's, that was the defense and, and I do appreciate that they did not decide to make me an example and fire me because of that. But yeah, you know, it was, it was definitely, it was a lesson learned from, from both parties. I think that, um, it was clear that the, the people that they were hurting by doing that were the, the people that really didn't deserve that. Um, but there's, there's a lot about making the voice actors on these shows, replaceable by making them also be anonymous and i never did that like i i promoted myself and the connection with it from the beginning i used it while on tour with with the band Mm -hmm. i used it for everything i could because i didn't want to be oh we didn't realize they even replaced that actor because we didn't know that act the first actor's name 
there were times that we were told that we were replaceable there. Like I, it was a yeah. strange lesson to learn at a very young age. You know, we've spoken yeah. and I don't remember, I don't know when it will air, but about, you know, the meeting we had where they said, we'll go to Canada. If you guys ask for more money, we'll just, yeah. we'll, you know, we're, we we do not need you. Um, yeah. and then that kind of leads into, uh, something we've spoken about on the show, uh, is when, when the, uh, the cast of Pokemon got, when, four kids lost the rights to Pokemon and the cast was replaced. There are yeah. different versions of that story. And again, you being on staff, I think do probably have a different version of how that went down than the other yeah. actors. Um, yeah. I mean, I remember how uh, the, the, just the, the dirty deeds of how it was taken um, away um, and, and the undercutting that was going on there. Mm -hmm. But the other, the, the side of it from the, from the actor side, not from the production side was, I was never told you have an opportunity to, you know, continue working for them. Like that was never even dangled. Right. And of course, I was never threatened that if I did decide to work for them, I couldn't work for four kids. I was the senior voice director. What right. are you you're going to you're going to tell me I can still direct all these shows, but I just can't act on them if I'm acting on this other show. Um, I think that at that time, whatever they wanted, which was from what I remember, uh, you know, they wanted a break on some of the production costs. Um, I remember having a meeting once where someone brought up maybe getting rid of the bubble mailers we used to mail the master tapes to the network. Stop and it. I spoke, and I spoke up and I said, so the thing that we spend like, I don't know, $30,000 on a week, you don't want to spend $1.50 on a, on a mailer? What? Yeah. I almost got in trouble in that meeting because it wasn't my place to speak up, but I was shocked. Yeah. Wow. So, so I, th I think that, I think that, um, there was definitely, Hey, we want to spend less. The show makes us all a lot of money. We want to also make you earn less, um, for the production of the show. And I think there was a lot of pushback of no, no, um, we, it has to be the same way or take it somewhere else and you won't be as successful. Um, so I think that's really where that came from. But the but the actors? No. No. I mean, maybe Veronica will tell you a, a different version of, of conversations she might have had. They never spoke to me ever. No one ever reached out to me to even see if I was interested, to see if I wanted to continue, to see if I was willing. And I'll tell you what I've learned then, because we've now interviewed many people about this. So you technically did have a clause in your contract that said you were not allowed to do it. So Pokemon could not come after you and ask you to do it. So so what what had to happen was, because it was a sunset clause that I believe lasted a year or two, I don't know which exactly, um, at least one or two actors went to Norman and said, are you going to enforce this clause? Because they were going to go after Pokemon. They were going to present themselves to Pokemon as being right. available. And Norman right. said, well, I'm not going to enforce it. And again, I'm paraphrasing for him. We did talk to him about this, and, and you will be able to hear it. He's like, but, you know, you're not welcome on other four kids shows. You know, you can either go do Pokemon and continue those roles, or you can work yep. here where we have many roles. So I right. think what happened was one or two actors were spoken to. They spread the word. So it was all very unofficial. There was no, like, I, it would have been great if, like, an offic something official had gone out, like, hey, we're not going to sue you for breaking your contract. Or right. it would have been great if they said, we understand that you need to make money. We'll let you out of your contract. Of course you can still work here. You, this is but business. you're saying you're saying that the actors were worried about being sued, or are you talking about that the new production company was worried that if they went after the actors that Both. they would be sued? Both. I think. I think that. Yeah. Yeah. So it, you know, I mean, though so many of those people, the the, the cast of characters, no pun intended, um, I don't think that half of them even were like just knowledgeable about all of the nuances of that. Yeah. I think that so many conversations happened between new company and this and that, that it could have been even, hey, off the record, Eric, would you even be interested? Like, nothing. Um, and so many of these kids come up to me and say, yeah. you know, you're the voice of my childhood. I grew up watching you, stuff like that. Like, that's what that's what matters to me. Like, would yeah. I would I love to play those characters again? Yeah, but you know what? I played those characters to the best that I could for so many years. And, you know, it's like Batman. It's like there's different actors that have played Batman. Mm -hmm. Just pick your favorite. Yeah. Like, 
And if and if I'm and your you favorite, can like a lot, and you can like more than one. Yeah, yeah. Like if I'm your if I'm your favorite, you know, James, then great. I'm flattered. If you think that someone else, you know, makes you laugh more, great. You're laughing. I'm happy about that. Like it's not a personal uh, like attack to me. Mm-hmm. Like I I don't take it personally. I I know that for me, I've been the best Eric Stewart that I could be. I can't be a better so-and-so, right? This is who I am. Yeah. So if you like my performance, great. If you like someone else's performance doing it, great. Just don't ask me to sign their picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, I'm, that's, now I'm totally going to ask you to do that. Um, right. All right, let's move on, and we'll wrap this up sh- soon. So I know that you were in the process of moving to Nashville after that. that how much yep. longer after that did you decide to to? Leave New York. You're a you're a Brooklyn boy. When did you decide to go? So um, one evening I came home to my beautiful brownstone and the kids were asleep. And if for those of you who don't know the layout of a brownstone, it's like the garden level is where we, we enter. And then the, the parlor levels where our bedrooms were. And then on the top level, I had a rental up, up, up there. So we lived on two different floors. And then we had a dugout basement where the washer dryer is. And I'm talking maybe, I don't know, 10 by 10 little, you know, area dug into the ground. No real, you know, floor. Anyway, I come home. It's like 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night because that's what a lot of my days were like. And I go downstairs and I sit on the washing machine with my acoustic guitar and I'm writing. And uh, my ex-wife now, but my wife at that time, uh, Jenna, came downstairs and said, you own this house, you work like this, you take care of everybody, and the thing you love to do, you have to do in the laundry room in the basement of your house. And I was like, well, I don't want to wake up the kids. And she's like, this is ridiculous. Now, we had been talking about making a move. And so then I said, all right, either we do this, make the move to Nashville, which I had been working back and forth for a while, or we never speak of it again. And so I sent Jenna with the two girls to go look at schools and look at houses because I'd been there so many times. I knew that I, I mean, working in a studio, I don't even have a window. I don't, you know, I could be anywhere. They had to be happy. The schools had to be right. The house had to be right, whatever. They had to like it. I said, if you come back and you don't like anything about that city, about that town, about those schools, then we won't talk about it anymore. So they go down and they see the schools. They come back with a whole list of of, of houses. And uh, Jenna shows me eight potential houses. And I look at them and I'm like, okay, okay. Um, Are they in order of your preference? She said, yeah, the first one is definitely my first choice. That would definitely work for us. It's like a block from the school and this and that. I said, okay, I'm going to put an offer on it. And she said, but you haven't even seen it. I said, it's got a, you know, it's got a place for my studio. It's in a good school zone. You like it. it I know what it's like down there. Then we're going to do it. So I put my house on the market. I moved them. So first I sent them down there. Um, they, they moved down there in August. Um, then September 11th happened. And it took me nine months to sell my house in New York. And the story I will tell you is, and just to give you an idea of how wonderful a person Norman can be, is I had so much vacation time, paid vacation saved up. As the senior voice actor, I could never go away for very long. I knew that if I left, things wouldn't get done the way that I had been doing them, not to take away from anyone else who was doing stuff there, but I just you couldn't take... You mean as take... a senior voice director, not actor. Director. Sorry, senior yeah, voice yeah. director. Yeah. Sorry about that. So if I left for my four weeks, right, um, especially since I I had it in my contract, it all added up. I had 10 years, basically, of vacation. Mm-hmm. And so I went to Norman and I said, Norman... I'm letting you know that I'm going to move to Nashville. Um, my house is on the market. My family's down there. I, I'm trying to sell my house. Um, I could either take all my vacation right now and move them down there, and you wouldn't see me for like three months because I, I, I have it in mm-hmm. my contract. Or I could, every three weeks, take a week off so that I could move my stuff down there gradually and continue working here. And he said, Eric, obviously I'm going to have to replace you at some point, but 
I think you are doing what 50 people that work here should be doing. You should be following your passion and do what you you deserve to do and not wake up one day and go, what did I do with my life? So here's what I'm going to do for you. You do that. You make sure you keep my schedule going and I will keep you on staff until you sell your house. Wow. And it took me and it took me nine months. I was I had two homes. I was away from my family for so much of that as they started their new life down there. I drove a moving truck three times by myself for 14 hours. Oof. I moved myself because I, I couldn't afford, I, I had two mortgages. Um, and the very last, I, I was eating peanut butter and jelly. That's what I had. I had I had one plate, one glass in my house. And I get into the truck to drive for the last, the third trip. And offers had fallen through and this and that. And it was very hard for people to get a mortgage because of all the craziness that was happening in the world. Not to turn this into this long story about my relocation, but, um, and I'm not a religious person at all. I'm, I'm a spiritual person. I believe that there's some energy in the world and things like that. Um, but I, you know, I'm not praying to God every day. That's not my thing. And if that's what you do, I, I totally respect that. I get it. I'm halfway there and I have two houses. I have no money in my bank account. And I say, if you're testing me, I got nothing left. So let me know what else I'm supposed to do because I, I, I got nothing. And when I arrived in Nashville, I got a call from my realtor in New York saying, you have an offer on the house. Yeah. Oh. And that and that was it. Yeah. And now and now and I couldn't even be there. at the closing. You've lived there ever since. Eric still lives I, in Nashville. Yeah. I have I have lived in Nashville now for twelve years. Wow. I mean, I should have moved down here earlier. I mean, I I, I no place is perfect, but for me, you know, meeting people that I consider like new best friends, you know, later in life like that, that's kind of rare. And yeah, and yeah. There's a creativity down here and there's a there's a friendliness down here. There's also diversity here. I mean, growing up in Brooklyn, I was surrounded by everything and I loved that. And I wanted my kids to be surrounded by that. Yes, I live in the South. Yes, you know, it's it's a red state, but this is a little blue dot. Like there's yeah. there there's the, the 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 schools that are here, the 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 diversity that's here, um, it's just quality of life. Oh my goodness! And you don't know what you're dealing with until you step away from it. And I mean, going back to what you know, you know we're talking about running around New York City like a maniac. Mm-hmm. That's not priority here. When I first started working down here, the, no one ever asked me to work in the evening. No one, unless I was playing music, no <laughs> one ever asked me to work on a weekend because that was family time. Right. And there was no one standing behind me wi- waiting to take that job for me because I said, I can't work Saturday because I'm taking my kids to a, you know, a dance recital. Yeah. It just wasn't on that. That's not how things work here. It was just a different approach to life. So, yeah, yeah. I love it here. Oh, well, that's a good note to end on. Oh, yeah. No, I'm so I'm so glad that you did that and that you looked out for you. And and, and Eric, let's plug your band, at least, like because we haven't even named them yet. And, and it's the most original name. It's the Eric Stewart <laughs> band. And 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 the reason it's called that is because a guitar player of mine, because I used to do a lot of shows solo. And then as the band, he's like, hey, man, we need to come up with a name for the band so that they know when you're not doing solo stuff, but that that the group is there, too. And I said, well, I always hate names that sort of, you know, dictate the type of music you're going to play, because some days I write a folk song. Sometimes I write a dance song and said, you know, I don't want to be called like Slaughter or Megadeth or something like that. And then come out with like a classical album. And so, so he's like, all right. I said, so what do you think? And he's like, I think it should be the Eric Stewart band. I'm like, sold. Yeah. All right, good. Let's go. Let's make some T-shirts. <laughs> well, if you ever do rebrand, I do have one idea. Yeah, what's that? Eric Stewart and the Dick Dick Van Dicks. Yes. Ba-da-bum. Yes. Back to the beginning, a callback yeah. moment. <sighs> wow. Yeah. Wow, that was pro. That well, was pro. Eric Stewart, full circle. Er- Steve is drawing a circle in there. <laughs> I'm proud of me for that. Um, Eric, thank you. God, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, no, thank Mm -hmm. you. 
Thanks for including me. And Steve, I'm 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 sorry I kept interrupting you, Steve. No, sorry I'm no. Know. This is your ep- this is your episode. <laughs> you know, I'm. I think one of the things we always talk about off mic, not with our uh, guests, usually it's like I don't want to just ask convention questions. Uh, like, <laughs> yeah, and, and what's nice is that you guys are talking about the history of something that is. You know, I mean, we were lucky. We're we're part mm-hmm. of pop culture history uh, yeah. in a good way most of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and yes, it's it's interesting to get that behind the scenes stuff and dig a little dirt. Um, but honestly, like even with all the craziness, I wouldn't do it differently. Yeah, like it was. It's it's such a part of my life, and it's such an an important part of of who I am. Um, yeah, as, as crazy as it is. So hopefully, I didn't offend too many people. But that's also part of my personality. <laughs> no, I don't. I think I think people like hearing the truth, and I I I yeah. yeah again, this is somewhat an oral history of four kids and if if we don't do this and tell these stories now we're just getting older and our memories are just getting worse so and it's really big basically rashomon all right like we all have different <laughs> versions of, of this yeah, you know, yeah. i'm sure that, that that's what you're getting to to be like i don't remember mm-hmm. it that way it's like that's what i saw so, yeah anyway. it's the closest we're gonna get um go on with your life say hi to your beautiful wife Lindsay. um and um hopefully we will all be together soon and hug it out i hope so Yes, I think so. That I, that would be wonderful. And thank you again for having me, guys. Great show. Well, that was fun yes. and touching and <laughs> yeah. funny and sad and poignant and... And wistful and nostalgic. And, and all of the things. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm really, you know, the truth is you can't do this podcast without talking to someone like to Eric specifically, uh, he really saw uh, he saw a lot, and I and I'm mm-hmm. surprised at at as being a voice director, some of the things decisions he was involved in that I don't think other I don't think other voice directors were as involved in. Almost he was almost a producer at certain points. Yeah. It's, it feels like. Yeah, I mean, like we said at the start, and also just hinted at in the interview too there from the very beginning you know in the pokemon yeah. days and yeah I, and i agree i couldn't see us uh uh doing the show without speaking to him at certain point uh, at a yeah. certain point and i think even like so much there's so much that I, I bet he could still talk about uh that we didn't even scratch the surface but i think what we got was a very you know, personal look back uh for himself on on those days and yeah and something I, I do want to say is, you know, after after the interview, we talked to him a little bit and he said, oh, have you spoken about this show yet? And he asked us about a couple of the later shows. And what, what keeps happening during these interviews is we, you know, we don't want to keep people forever. And we mm-hmm. get so much good information about the early shows that we I hope you guys don't feel slighted that we haven't gotten really into to Mew Mew yet or to Chaotic and some of these other shows. And Please know that we are, uh, I've said this a few times, we're, we're trying to go chronologically. So there will be people that hopefully will come back and talk about some of the later shows there. Um, because we are trying to make this, you know, kind of an oral history and it, it does have to work chronologically. Um, but again, you are always welcome to send in your, your specific mm-hmm. questions. Um, and hopefully we will do more of a deep dive into those yeah, uh, for sure. magical do re mi and all of that. Yeah. yeah, don't don't feel slighted. I think we just you know we talk about like I think sometimes the first things come out are just the things we know best, and right. I don't just have a one piece agenda, <laughs> but <laughs> I and, do have yeah. many many questions. <laughs> well, and and that's fair. And like for me, I because of the time that I moved, I wasn't working on those later shows, so I mm-hmm. know less about them, and I know less of the cast members. There were a lot of new people and actors that came in. Uh, you know, they had like 20 people doing all the shows for a while. So that was going to, you know, at some point they were going to have to recast or not recast, but bring in new talent. And a lot of us moved. So mm-hmm. it makes sense. But so I am starting to reach out to the the people that worked there in later years. Um, I have a whole list. Oh, you guys just wait. Yeah, um, but <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. Uh, this is a very long episode. So we will just tell you to... Uh, the things that we always tell you, which are, <laughs> I don't know why I find it funny. There's the website. That's fourkidsflashback.com. Yes, that. We're, yes. <laughs> I almost I almost messed myself up. 
Uh, but the way you don't mess yourself up is you use the number four. You don't the use the number four, the not word the word. Four. Don't spell it. Mm-hmm. Don't show off like I can spell the number four. <laughs> no, just put the number four. That's it. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, you did it. And on the site, then there you can find all the different places. Like if you don't like the podcast app you're using for some reason, there's all the different places you can listen to it. Uh, we're on YouTube. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, TuneIn. Uh, there's a lot of different options for listening to the show. But if you don't, if you hate commercials and you want episodes early, there is a magic trick you can do. What is that yeah. magic trick? This time you type in <laughs> patreon.com slash four kids flashback. So with the number four. Patreon, uh, P- P-A-T-R-E-O-N. We've never spelled it before. Maybe you're a terrible speller. I feel so bad that I've never spelled it for you before. God forbid if you've never typed anything in Google to remind yourself how to spell something. But Yeah. So Patreon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Patreon. Yeah, you go there and you know, you know, just give us five bucks, five bucks a month, and that gets you uh, episodes ad-free and a week early. Yeah. You go. You're so fancy. You got a Patreon subscription. Um, and if you need to uh, tell the world that you love 4Kids Flashback, you can buy merch. Uh, just follow the links on our site. And um, I think that'll do it. Oh, and thank you to the Patreon members that we already have. You guys are – can I say you guys are the shit? Do I, I'm not, I don't usually curse on this podcast, but there it is. Oh, and if you want to be on our on the good list this year, uh, go to um, Apple Podcasts or Spotify and all any of those. A thumbs up on YouTube is always a nice thing to do. Leave a nice review. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's the nice thing to do. Yeah, we all want to be nice. <laughs> oh, that was my phone. Just went my. My parents are checking in on me, which means we got to go, but we will. We'll catch you next time. Four Kids Flashback is a production of Maji Media, hosted by Tara Sands and Steve Yurko. Producers are Zach Logan, Tara Sands, and Steve Yurko. For more information, go to fourkidsflashback.com. That is the number four. And if you worked at Four Kids and have a story you want to share, please email us at fourkidsflashback at gmail.com. You can find us on social media at Four Kids Flashback. And to listen early and ad free, head to patreon.com slash fourkidsflashback. For podcast merchandise, find links on our website and link tree. As they say on every podcast, if you liked this show, please subscribe, rate, and review, and tell your friends or four. If you want to check out other Maji Media podcasts, go to Maji, M-A-J-I, dot media. Thanks for listening.